distinguished seminar on electronic systems technology. I'm Philip Wong, a faculty member in the electrical engineering department. You know, electronic systems is uh, the heart of information society that have really profound changed our lives. In the coming decades, the demand for energy efficient electronic systems will only accelerate. Yet, as Professor Hennessy will show you today, the sustained advances that were made in the last 50 years is now slowing down. So there's no doubt that the electronic system technology will continue to be important and it is at the cusp of major technology shifts that will be as transformative as those witnessed by Professor John Denver many decades ago. Now these lectures have been created to help us explore our paths going forward and to honor John Nimble's enormous legacy as both a faculty member and a department chair. So I'd like to pass it on to Professor Stephen Boyd to say a few words now. So I'll actually say a very uh, few words. So I'm, uh, I'm Stephen Boyd. I'm the uh, chair of electrical engineering as of uh, seven weeks ago or something like that. Um, I'm extremely happy to be here uh, at this inaugural uh, lecture. Uh, celebrating uh, basically one of the giants of our department. Uh, John basically shaped it, um, being chair for 16 years, I, I believe. Uh, so so I'm, I'm, I got a long way to go, I guess. Um, so um, he shaped, and, that, and actually uh, nothing, uh, actually I'm, I've been around at Stanford long enough to be able to say uh, happily that we were actually colleagues. Uh, so. Um, we are very lucky here. It's very appropriate uh, to have um, another giant uh, of Stanford EE and indeed of Stanford, uh, Jim Gibbons, a uh, uh, Linville student, former student, uh, will introduce the inaugural lecturer, yet another Stanford EE and Stanford giant, <laughs> John Hennessy. Uh, so, Jim, please. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I was John Hennessy's first PhD student. John Linville's first PhD John Linville. One can wish that I be bored. I took John's first class when he came here. I thought it was just spectacular. And um, so then I changed my field from working in information theory with Bill Harmon to being in semiconductors with John. And uh, thereby hands a tail. Uh, first this afternoon, I want to welcome Greg Linville and his wife Betty to the lecture. Greg is John's son. John, uh, Greg, if you and Betty stand up, everybody. John's daughter, Candace, and her husband, Chris, wanted to be here, but had to send their regrets as they were unable to attend the last evening. It is a great pleasure for me to say a few words about John Hinsdale's legacy at Stanford and introduce John Hennessy, the inaugural speaker for the Hinsdale's English Seminar on Electronic Systems Technology. I'll start at the beginning. Fred Terman recruited John Hinsdale in 1954 asking him to build a program in the application of transistors. At the time, John was on an extended leave from MIT, working at the Bell Labs on transistor circuit design problems. Building a graduate program in transistor circuit design was what Fred Terman had in mind when he asked John to, quote, transistorize the Stanford EE curriculum. John said later that uh, he was very pleased with Terman's offer, but that he would have returned to MIT if they had offered him tenure. If they didn't, and they did. Thus creating a future for the EE department at Stanford that was surely beyond even Fred Terman's imagining. Your program booklet contains a partial sketch of John and Bill's legacy. Among its important milestones were the creation of three new laboratories of Earth of approximately 23 years. The first of these labs was created so that PhD students in electrical engineering 
to build with semiconductor devices as part of their research program. At the time, no EE department in the country had such a laboratory. A photograph, look on the inside of your booklet here, a photograph on the top of the first page and the inside page shows Silicon Stanford's first silicon device, built in 19, March 1988. It worked well. Unfortunately, it was built on a silicon wafer that was the size of a dime and is barely vis visible in the photo. Sorry about that. A little over 10 years later, integrated circuits had to be placed individual transistors as the components of choice for assistive design. John and his colleagues especially Jim Michael, then created a new laboratory where students could build integrated circuits as part of their state research. Same song, same purpose. John participated actively in this new laboratory where he and his graduate students created the custom integrated circuits that were necessary to build the Opticon, a reading aid for the blind that John had invented. Back page of your and that shows a picture of John and his blind daughter Candace giving a paper at the International Solid State Interpretants Conference in 1969. Candy read at a speed of 75 words per minute. The paper received a still unmatched standing ovation from the audience. There was not a dry eye in the house. To describe the last of these laboratories, the Center for Integrated Systems, I want to first turn to quotes from recent email exchanges that I've had with the Glenville family. Quotes, we would like to thank you for passing along the good news about the distinguished lecture series that will be named for our father, John Glenville. We know he would have been deeply honored by this recognition of his contributions to Stanford and to the field of engineering. As you know, our father's interests were very broad. He was always interested in learning new things and in the ideas, innovations, and projects that his colleagues were engaged in. He was especially interested in how technology could be used to improve people's lives and to address real-world problems. He was committed to bringing concepts from different fields together to create new opportunities for collaboration and innovation. This happened when the Center for Integrated Systems was created. Signed, Candida Milberg and Greg Lindell. The CIS opened its doors in 1980. This laboratory from the beginning was a systems laboratory, engaging faculty in both EE and CS departments. The components of choice for electronic system design then, in 1980, were general purpose microprocessors in both and the software that is necessary to program them for specific applications in both computation and communications. The CIS research agenda focused increasingly on new computing architectures and the special devices and hardware that were required for their implementation. The future of this paradigm, I believe, is going to be addressed today by John Hansen. My last contact with the Lynn Mill family prior to this lecture was to tell them that the faculty had chosen John Hennessy to give the inaugural lecture. They wrote back to say, quotes, thank you for your message. We think John Hennessy is an excellent choice to give the inaugural lecture, both because he is such a remarkable person and because our dad had such respect and fondness for him. In this, Candy and Greg expressed our sentiments precisely. John Hennessy is not only a reasonable, uh, is not only a remarkable person, he's also reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> he has had in addition a truly phenomenal career at this game. We are all indebted to him for his extraordinary leadership in the CS and ED departments, as dean of the School of Engineering, as provost, and as president of the university for 16 years. Please join me in welcoming John in the inaugural lecture in the John G. Lindell Distinguished Seminar Series on Electronic Systems Technology.
Well, I should say that I first met John Linville on the day I interviewed for a faculty position at Stanford. Um, sitting in his office in McCullough, I went over, and of course, he was a great man. I had already, that my morning had started with an interview with Don Knuth, so you can imagine I was on thin ice at that point. But John was welcoming. I could tell immediately that he was somebody that deeply believed in recruiting great young faculty and investing in them. And certainly that was the case with me. He also had a very, as Jim has alluded to, a very expansive view of what electronic technology and its impact were about. And of course that led to CIS, which uh, greatly affected um, my career as well. So what I'm going to talk about today is really a massive change in the way we think about computing in the future, which is a coming together of multiple things. Technology, but not just technology. There are other aspects of it. But first, I have to start out by saying, what an incredible golden age. If you look from 1977, the first microprocessor, four bits, four bits, right? I mean, about 3,000 transistors, that's it. Um, through to today, roughly 40% annual performance improvement roughly a million times faster in that period, throughput. Um, and what happened? Well, obviously, as you got more transistors, things got wider from 8 bits to 16 bits to 32 to 64. Um, we had a big push on instructional level parallelism. I'm going to say a lot about that. But basically, if you go back to the era of the 1970s, it takes about 10 clock cycles to implement an instruction on a typical early microprocessor. Now, a typical microprocessor does four instructions every single clock cycle, or tries anyway. And then multi-core from one processor per chip to 32, or maybe even more if they're smaller and more, um, more limited in, in uh, capability. And clock rate from 3 megahertz to 4 gigahertz. Now. That's a combination of technology, but also architecture. There's a lot of architecture changes that underlie and made it possible to do that. But without the changes in integrated circuit technology, without the dramatic impact of Moore's Law, you never could have gotten this. In fact, in some ways, what, what architect's job has been for many years was to take a yearly quadratic increase in the number of transistors, or, or every 18 months, let's say, and turn them into faster machines. Because transistors were getting, you were getting a lot more at a rate that it even exceeded how much faster they were getting. Um, so that's coming to an end. Moore's Law is beginning to slow down. It's not ended yet, as I'll show you, but it's slowing down. But probably the bigger crisis right now is the end of uh, Dennard scaling, which basically said that power per transistor shrinks at basically linear as the transistor gets smaller. That's going away, and that's created a real crisis. That end of, of Dennard scaling, that fact that you cannot put more transistors on a chip without increasing the power, has really created a, a problem. Um, the fact that Moore's Law is slowing down creates a secondary issue. Both these things actually <coughs> underlie this. If you have transistors that are not efficiently used, they take up area, they burn power, they cost. So the issues of efficiency are very deeply rooted here. Well, that's a problem because some of the things that are happening on the architectural side are pushing the limits of efficiency and whether or not you can get a more efficient design. So that's creating a, a difference in how we think about uh, architecting those machines. And then finally, there's a big application shift. The desktop and the personal computer ruled for so many years. That's not the important part of the spectrum. The important part is either in my pocket or it's in massive cloud-based computer centers, right? An acre of computers. Small one, think of a million cores. That's a small one. Okay, so these big, gigantic cloud machines that have different constraints. Um, this just shows you single processor performance, what's happened over time. So, Look at this error right in here, 52% per year improvements in performance. Really dramatic error, sort of beginning with the very first uh, risk processors in here and then going up until it begins to slow down. Then it slows down more, 
in the last few years, 3.5% per year. That's almost nothing in terms of unit processor performance, almost nothing. And energy efficiency has become the new metric. It's the thing everybody cares about. Um, if you look at these portable devices, while the, the panels, the, the screen tends to take up the most power, second, the processor and the chipset surrounding the processor become the second largest power consumer. So if you're walking around something battery life matters, which it does, um, then you have to worry a lot about that. The thing that might surprise people is in the cloud. You care a lot about energy efficiency. It's not immediately obvious. You said, well, I've got an acre of computers. Well, I, well I'm going to buy my power to <coughs> a power company with big cables coming in. Why do I care? Because the cost of the power infrastructure is so high. So in terms of capital cost, here are the servers. Here's power and cooling. Capital cost is about the same for a large-scale data center. And even when you look at amortization effective operating cost, that's dominated by the servers primarily because they get written off in about three to four years, while the power infrastructure lasts about 10. But it's second only to the computers. So big part of the cost equation. Okay, so that's sort of a shift in what we, what we care about in terms of energy and power. At the same time, we're running into the slowdown in Moore's Law. Perhaps most dramatic in DRAMs. DRAMs have some unusual things about their structure that makes them more acute in terms of pushing the edge. The primary one, well, look at, look at this slowdown. So 77 to 97, about 1.4x growth a year, then down to 1.34, then down to 1.1. There is not even an announced follow-on for DDR4. So DDR4, for 20 years we've had these memory specs. Boom, 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 boom. Everybody agrees on what the standard is. There is no DDR5. There's no announced follow-on spec for next generation <coughs> DRAMs. So that's an amazing change. Here's the, this is the best graphic I've found for explaining it. So here's the aspect ratio of a modern DRAM. Depth, this is the trench that contains the capacitor. It's 25 to 1. Here's the tallest building in the world, six to one. So imagine you're, what's already been done is phenomenal. To expect to continue that incredible progress is probably unrealistic. But there's also a slowdown in other measures of Moore's Law. Uh, this shows the transi transistor counts and Intel processors as a way of measuring that, what's the density of transistors. And it's beginning to deviate from the Moore's Law line that you would have here. Not as dramatically as DRAMs, but it's certainly accelerating in terms of its separation. But the end of Dennard scaling, which basically said that you had constant power per millimeter square of silicon. That's the simple way to think about it. If you think about what that means, constant power per millimeter squared of silicon means that energy per computation is decreasing. Because from one generation of silicon to the next, I get more transistors. Those transistors burn the same power, but they're more than They better do more work. And if they do more work, energy is actually dropping per computation. So that happened for a long time, uh, from about 1977 till about 1997. And then it began fading. And 1997 begins really when it begins to fade. Um, and then starting 2007, very rapid. Essentially gone today. So here's a, here's a plot which shows this. Okay, so we're looking at technology in terms of nanometers, the increase in technology. And then we're looking at power, energy per nanometer squared. Now, that's power, it's not energy. I'm sorry, I have to be careful. It's power, not energy. So there is an improvement in performance that goes along with that. So it's not quite as bad as that chart makes it look, but it's not good. It's not good. And that's really driving so much of what, um, what's happening uh, as people think about future generations of, of processors. I think of this as a crisis. Um, it's a crisis in the sense that it puts 
processors in a really difficult situation. If you had told me 20 years ago that microprocessors would turn themselves off or slow their clocks down to prevent overheating, I would have said, you're crazy. That's never going to happen. Every single big processor out there does it today. Turns off cores, slows down clocks in order to prevent um, exceeding the thermal dissipation capability of the package that it's in. So we've got to think about how we, how we solve that problem. The difficulty is, the natural reaction is to say, well, design architectures that are more efficient in terms of power. But our problem is that the dominant general purpose architectural techniques have reached their limits and pushing them further creates diminishing returns and it creates rapidly diminishing returns when you look at it from a perspective of energy efficiency. And the reasons for that are some having to do with instruction level parallelism and the way we push those performance of those processors up in that period where it was going up 50% a year. Some of it has to do with problems in multi-core. Um, and there are even issues with caches, which have become the way in which we hide the latency gap between a processor running in the gigahertz range and relatively slow DRAMs. Um, even they have problems. You just can't throw more transistors in it and get very much performance out of it. So, three minute tutorial on instruction level parallelism um, so you can understand what's happening here. So this is the way processors used to work up till about, well, up until the early risk days, so say through the mid 80s, through the early 80s. Um, imagine red car is an instruction and white car is an instruction. So you start red car instruction. Let's suppose it takes five clock cycles. So it takes five clock cycles. When it finishes, you start white car instruction. Okay, so you get one instruction done every five clock cycles. That's how processors indeed used to work. So then there's a very clever idea called pipelining. Um, and it, it's exactly what it sounds like. It sounds like an assembly line. It is an assembly line. You just start red car, you start white car one cycle later, another white, a different white car, another cycle later, another white car. Now notice each instruction still takes five clock cycles, but you get an instruction done every clock cycle. That's the key idea behind instruction level parallels. That's one key idea. The next thing you do, so that took us from about early 1980s up until, say, just after 1990, early 19, mid-1990s, maybe. Um, these got deeper and deeper and deeper, right? Here I'm taking five, but imagine in a modern processor, think of that as 15 clock cycles long. So there are 15 instructions overlapped in a pipeline that's 15 deep, right? And all I've done is I took the steps and I sliced them into little tiny pieces and I allowed instructions to follow <coughs> gang along um, convoy style, one behind the other. Okay, the next thing people did was, well, duplicate the track. Have two racing tracks, so two cars are going at the same time. I can start two, two cars down the racetrack every single clock cycle. Now I've got 10 times the throughput because I have two instructions starting every clock. And they're five times as fast as they used to be. 10 times out of that idea. So these were the two ideas that dominated architecture from, say, 82 till about the mid-90s. So what happened? So the, the key thing to understand is that we push this technology really hard. Initially, five-stage clocks. Today, an Intel i7 has about a 15-stage pipeline. It does have a 15 stage pipeline, not a bad. That's what it has. Um, that allows the clock rate to speed up a lot. Um, it means you have to add some extra logic, but it's actually not that hard to do. And then we went to multiple issue. Um, a modern Intel processor can issue uh, four instructions every single clock. Uh, an IBM power processor can do six, but they're in that range. Okay? So we've got a lot of throughput. Um, this. While that requires some careful timing uh, and some energy issues, uh, this requires a big increase in transistor count as well. There's a lot of complexity to doing multiple instructions per clock, uh, a lot of complexity. Um, 
So that's where a lot of the transistor count goes. Why did this end? It simply ended because it became energy inefficient to go any further down that road. And a way to think about this is suppose I have four instructions every clock starting. So I got four race cars starting every cycle. And I'm 15 deep. That means I have 60 instructions in execution, what we call in flight. 60 instructions are in flight at any given time. 60. Okay. Now in a modern Intel processor, in order, to, in order to maintain 60 and to get some throughput, you probably have to have 120 to 140 instructions actually in flight. Well, has anybody ever seen a piece of code with 120 instructions in sequence with no branches? Certainly, there are loops, right? There are if-then-else statements in the code. So you've got all these branches. How can I possibly get more than 100 instructions in flight with all those branches? The answer is, I guess. I speculate. So what happened is we built these elaborate prediction mechanisms that predict what happens with branches, whether a branch is taken or not taken. Fairly easy to do loop branches, right? They're mostly taken. If the loop runs many times, then the branch going back to the top of the loop is taken most of the time. So we predict the branch, we guess that the prediction is right, and we begin piling instructions into the pipeline as if the prediction was right. So think about what happens as I look at more and more instructions. If, for example, I have 15 instructions I'm looking at, that would typically, that would have about four branches in it. To get all four branches right, 94% of the time, I have to predict each one correctly, 98.7%. If I have 60 instructions in flight, to get 90% accuracy, that means all 15 branches are predicted correct, I have to have 99% accuracy. And if I take that up to 120, the number becomes mind-boggling. Right? Very hard to do. Very hard to have that kind of accuracy. So what does that translate into? Well, unfortunately, when I speculate, and I speculate wrong, I guess the branch incorrectly, I do a lot of work. It takes me 15 clock cycles to figure out, by the way, that's the branch of prediction in this time on a modern processor, 15 cycles. I don't find out to 15 cycles later. I pile in all these instructions. I'm executing them as if they're really useful work. And then I got the branch. I have to pull all that stuff out and throw it away and restart. Okay, that's what happens when you speculate. Buy Bitcoin, you'll discover. <laughs> <laughs> so this is just a simple way of looking at it. Here are a bunch of benchmarks. Uh, these ones are integer, these ones are floating point down here. And this shows you on an Intel Core i7 how much of the work is wasted. Meaning, I executed instructions that were useless. <coughs> that I ended up throwing away. So 30%, 25%, 40% in some benchmarks, useless work. Now, obviously, I've lost all the energy that went along with that. I wasted my time, first of all. I did something useless. But all the energy that got burnt pursuing those instructions went down the drain. It just made the chip get hotter, that's all it did. Right? And it's not free <laughs> to clean those instructions out. There's also a bunch of overhead associated with cleaning and restarting the pipeline back up. So that's a real problem. And that's really what drove the end of the pursuit of instruction level parallelism. It's not theoretical, it's actually not a theoretical limit. You can show theoretically that there is plenty of parallelism out there. The problem is it's just hard to get unless you can build an oracle that tells you everything perfectly. So what happened? So everybody said, okay, we gotta give up on that. Let's go, let's go try another approach. 
And since we've now tried an approach where the compiler and the architect are responsible for finding all that instruction level parallelism, all gets figured out by the hardware and the compiler, let's make the programmer do the hard work. Let's make the programmer find the parallelism. Make them responsible for identifying things that can execute in parallel so that I can speed up the performance. So that gave rise to what became called the multi-core era. We would run separate threads designated by the programmer. Thread just means a separate <coughs> process that can run in parallel. We'd, the programmer would find those. We'd run them on separate cores. And now we've got a very simple strategy for scaling. You get more transistors, add more cores. Just put more cores on the chip. It's pretty easy. It doesn't involve a lot of complexity. There's some in the caches and things, but it's pretty straightforward to see how to do it. So, uh, of course, we've got this energy is still proportional to the number of transistors that are active, that are doing work for us. So I still have to use those cores efficiently if I'm going to use this technique to overcome the problem, the, the performance and the energy limits. But there's a little difficulty uh, that comes from Amdahl's law that makes this difficult. So Amdahl's law is an observation that Gene Amdahl made, oh, in the 1970s about computers that were parallel, that had multiple processors, multiple cores associated with them. And what Amdahl said is the speed up, how much faster that program will run, is limited by how much of it can only run on one processor or maybe four processors, when there are 16, let's say. And that limits how much faster the program can run. So what about this? Well, let's look first at a modern multi-core so you get an idea of what happens. So this is a Power 8, um, but it doesn't look that different than an Intel i7 multi-core, an AMD multi-core. Um, I've got a bunch of cores. Each one of these is a separate processor. They have their own caches here. Um, they're hooked up somehow with a network and they're hooked out to some kind of memory control as well as I.O. and other things. But the key thing is that each one of these cores can be designed separately and now I can just scale up by adding multiple cores. Well, what about the Amdahl's Law effect? How serious is the Amdahl's Law effect? So this just shows you, the answer is it's very serious. It was very serious when Amdahl predicted it, um, and it's still very serious. Um, this shows you, suppose I have 64 processors. Okay, so 64 cores. What happens if 10% of the code can only be run on one processor? Or 8% or 6% or 4% or 2% or 1%? 99% of the code can be run on 64 processors. 1%, only one, only one little percent has to run sequentially. Well, that limits your speed up to 36. Well, that's not very much of the code. Suppose 5% or 10%, then you're gonna be down here. Now, for many years, people have thought there are various ways to overcome Amdahl's law, and there are. But overcoming it in a general purpose computing environment turns out to be very hard. And repeatedly, yet just when everybody thinks, well, we've solved the problem uh, for these large workloads that we run and run on cloud machines, another instance of Amdahl's law raises its ugly head. Um, something becomes a key limiter. Any, to any extent that these processes need to coordinate with one another and synchronize, that creates an Amdahl's log bottleneck immediately. But remember, we also need to think about what are those processors doing that aren't doing any useful work because they're limited by the Amdahl's law of serialization. They're just waiting. They're standing there waiting for this little one processor to finish this little tiny 1% of the code so the rest of them can go ahead and execute the rest of them. But guess what they're doing when they're waiting? They're burning power. They're not shut down because shutting them down 
And you shut them down, it's a long time to restart them. This is not a fast process. You do not want to shut them down. Right? So the result is you have them waiting, typically, for a signal from the one processor that's through this one little section of code. OK, we're all done. Go ahead. So they're burning power. The problem is that the solution we picked has another source of energy inefficiency. And that means that the end of Dennard scaling is the end of multi-core scaling, at least as it's been done followed so far. So the result is we have what we call dark silicon. I mean, literally, cores get turned off. But you better be very careful before you turn the core off, because it takes a few million construction cycles to get the core turned back on. Now, how serious is this? Well, OK, today, take 22 nan nanometer process, large multi-core, the Intel E78890. It's a 24-core um, machine, 2.2 gigahertz. Notice that one of the things you'll notice is if you look at these large multi-core chips, they already have clock rates, which are almost a factor of two off of the small cores, right? So the desktop, your desktop machine, you can buy a 4 gigahertz desktop machine. You can't buy a 4 gigahertz large core because it radiates heat um, at an amazing amount. If you take that out to an 11 nanometer process uh, and you do the computation of how many cores you could fit, uh, it's about 96 cores and it would run roughly in the 5 gigahertz range. The expected power consumption of that processor would be 295 watts. 295 watts from a piece of silicon about this big, right? So um, if you look at what's happened with packaging technology, it improves relatively slowly. Today, the, that's a 165-watt uh, chip. Um, here's about, uh, this is about average package improvement over that same period. We get to about 180 watts of power dissipation. Um, even if you were aggressive and you assumed you could get to 200 watts, how many cores can you have active? Well, at 165 watts, only 96 of those 54 cores, only 54 of the 96 cores can be active on average. Only 54. Almost half of them are off. At 180, you can have almost 60 cores active. At 200 watts, you can have 65 cores active. You simply can't have more cores active unless there's a real breakthrough in removing heat from those packages. That's cost effective. We could go to liquid cooling. Seymour Cray was fond of saying, the hard part of designing computers isn't the electronics, it's the plumbing. <laughs> we may get back to that. We may get back to that. <clears throat> but that shows you how significant this limit is in terms of just having a straightforward path to take multi-core scaling way up. And if you look at the combination of what happens because the number of active cores is limited because of power, and Amdahl's law, then you get a really grim result. Namely, with 96 processors and 1%, only 1% of the code being sequential, you get a speed up of about 38. And that's it. 38, less than half the processor count. So basically, your efficiency is less than 50%. So that's pretty ugly. And that's why this uh, phrase, dark multi-core, dark silicon, has really arisen, because there's no simple way around that part of the problem. So is there a road forward? Luckily, I'm getting close to retirement, so I don't have to worry about that problem. <laughs> Unfortunately, I think there is no obvious path for general purpose processors. There's no obvious path. The failure of Dennard scaling means that any inefficiency translates into a real problem in terms of advancing that processor. And unfortunately, the way we know how to design, make processors faster is by making them less efficient, by burning transistors, basically, as a way to get speed <coughs> at faster than we would just get it from the clock rate. So there's no obvious way. 
is there an alter alternative way of thinking about the problem? Well, there's a great um, uh, draft paper out of, uh, from our colleagues at MIT entitled, There's Lots of Room at the Top. Um, and what they point out is that the last 20 years, we have abandoned efficiency in software in favor of productivity. So if you look at a modern software environment, somebody's programming in JavaScript or Python, they're u making use of libraries that were developed um, using polymorphic techniques that can be used for multiple functions. There's a lot of software reuse in that model, but there's a lot of inefficiency in that model. They have one example where they take a piece of code written in a mu on multiple levels of interpretation, they rewrite it in C, and it runs 10,000 times faster. So provided that you're willing to give up some of the efficiency we've gotten in terms of software productivity, then there's a route back. But this is a kind of the inverse of where we've been for many years, because where we've been for the last 30 or 40 years is hardware's getting faster. Don't worry about it, guys, software guys. Just write your code. Any way you get that code out there, don't worry about how efficient it is. But that may not work anymore. So that's one, that's one route. Um, but there's another route, which I think, from an architecture viewpoint, um, is potentially very attractive, which is to start thinking more about tailoring the architecture to some specific domain, what we call domain-specific architectures. So think of them, they're sort of like ASICs, but they're programmable. And the intention is not that the processor does one function, but it does a family of functions. The best known examples of these are GPUs, uh, graphics processor units, right? They're programmable, um, but they're clearly designed to do certain classes of problems that have certain structures, not just graphics, but other things that have similar kinds of structures and rely on linear algebra. Um, and now, most recently, you've seen a big rise of this with respect to neural networks and deep neural network computing. Again, it's a linear algebra problem. Um, so you build some special purpose machines to do that. In the past, if you look over history, except for very limited applications, the special purpose machines have never managed <coughs> to maintain an advantage over the general purpose architectures. Lots of people have tried. They've gotten out there and gotten a niche but it's been hard to hold onto that niche. But I think there are ways to hold onto that niche. And the ways to hold onto that niche is to build something which captures a class of problems, maintains programmability, maintains flexibility. And that's the way to hold on to it. So you might ask yourself, but why? Why will those domain-specific processors be faster? What about the architecture? We ought to be able to explain something that tells us why they'll be more efficient and faster. And indeed, there are some key underlying principles that um, people are taking advantage of. First of all, find a more effective way to do parallelism. Uh, in particular, the way we do parallelism in multi-core is what's called multiple instruction, multiple data. We've got a set of independent pieces of code that are running independently. In SIMD, single instruction, multiple data, we have one instruction that's broadcast to many different data units, but we only have to fetch one instruction. Control is a lot simpler, and it's a lot more efficient when it's a usable programming model. The other thing we do is we convert back to an older idea, an idea called BLIW, rather than have the hardware try to figure out which parts of instruction can go in parallel. We have the software figure out. Now, you're not going to take a big, gnarly piece of Unix code, an operating system or a C compiler or something, and get the hardware to figure that all out. But there are domains for which the structure is sufficiently well understood that the compiler can analyze the structure and do that piece of work that otherwise we rely on hardware to do. Uh, they make more effective use of memory bandwidth. So 
So one of the great inventions of modern computers was the idea of caching. It made the gap between DRAMs or before that even cores, uh, core memory, and processors much smaller. The problem is the caches don't always work. And when they don't work, they don't work in ugly ways. So they break down. If the programmer could manage that memory more efficiently, then I could get a decrease in the complexity and an increase in the performance out of it. So we used to move to user-controlled memories versus caches. Eliminate unneeded accuracy. So we all jumped on this bandwagon um, that uh, moved to IEEE standard arithmetic, very high precision, uh, lots of things. And for there are lots of programs in which that precision is simply not needed. So you can reduce, increase the, the throughput by <coughs> using smaller units, using 8 bits or 16 bits, for example, and by actually not having to be quite so accurate in terms of floating point grounding and other issues that are required to implement the standard. The key for all this to work is that you better have a domain-specific programming model which <coughs> makes it possible for the software to match with the hardware. That's the key. That's the key thing that has to happen. So this is a, um, this is a great uh, quote by Dave Cook. Dave Cook um, was a famous early software guy who did a lot of foundational work on compilers, but he worked on the ILLIAC 4, one of the first um, SIM, single instruction multiple data machines. And he was, by the way, the software architect. Because everybody knew the hard thing was designing the hardware, uh, not the software. He was the software architect. But he had this key insight. We really didn't understand how to get a good match between the software we wanted to run and the machine we were designing. As a result, the ILLIAC 4 never did very many general purpose things, despite the fact that it was a, a really path-breaking machine in terms of its approaches. So achieving performance in this new era is going to require thinking differently about it. If you think about what happened in the 1980s as we moved from people programming in assembly language to people programming in C and Fortran, what the architect had to do was to know what the output of a compiler looked like. Because everybody was using a compiler to compile their C or their Fortran down to something. The architect had to know what that fairly narrow interface looked like. And then they could build the machine as fast as they wanted underneath it. And indeed, all these speculation ideas came out of that way. Oh, by the way, in case you didn't know, um, that speculation idea is the reason there's a big security hole called Meltdown and Spectre. <laughs> It is exactly that speculation idea that creates that security hole, right? So here we were being very aggressive architects, thinking very clever about how we'd make the program go faster. And nobody realized that in roughly 1997 or 98, 2000, we opened a giant security hole that's been there for more than 15 years. 15 years, right? Uh, so there, there are a lot of issues here in, in how you think about that. But if, if I can change the way I build an interface between not just the low-level software, but the way in which programs are written, so that I'm thinking about the algorithms a lot more. I mean, if you think about what happens, take a, take a, a linear algebra problem, right? Take a ma big matrix multiply. And you boil it down into a bunch of individual instructions, you've lost all the structure. You've thrown it away. But that problem has a lot of structure and a lot of, you can, you can, if you can understand that structure and import it into the architecture and take advantage of it, you can capture a lot of efficiency. And that's, I think, what's going to have to happen in this era of domain specific architecture. It's going to create a lot of challenges because unlike one general purpose processor, 
which now covers 98% of the applications, you may end up having five or 10 or 15 or 20 different architectures optimized for different things. Right? So imagine that your self-driving car has an architecture optimized for machine learning and deep neural networks related to driving. Imagine that your giant machine in the cloud has a more general purpose deep neural network machine that's handling other kinds of problems, whether it be speech recognition, image recognition, um, medical diagnosis. diagnosis. Uh, imagine that your phone has something on so you can give your speech to your phone. And of course your virtual reality headset has some other kind of special purpose processor a domain-specific process that's designed for doing virtual reality or augmented reality kinds of thing. So you may have to have multiple different architectures covering the space. You're going to have to get the algorithms people and the people who understand applications to work much more intimately with both the software and the hardware people. And you're going to have to work on the problem of design cost. Because if you don't just have one big processor covering the space, but you've got to design 10 or 15, Oh boy, you better get the design cost of those 10 or 15 processors down significantly from where it is today. I think this, though, is the direction that we have to go. Um, and I think if it's pursued, and if we really can put together some rethinking of the interfaces between the hardware and software, that will give us enough of a bridge that hopefully our friends in the silicon world uh, will reinvent something that can follow on to silicon and maintain all the wonderful properties that we got to take advantage of in Moore's Law. And if we do that, we'll have a nice path forward. Thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to answer any questions. <laughs>